Calvary. And so I want to ask everyone as we begin to bow our heads as we pray. Our Heavenly Father, we come to you this evening and want to thank you that you have done so much for us. Every day you continue to bless us with life. You have cared for us throughout this week until the middle of this week. You have brought us together to continue with our lessons. And so we invite you to be with us and tabernacle with us. We invite your Holy Spirit to fill our hearts and our minds that we may receive your word as you desire it to be received in each one of us. And we know that your word, once it is sent out, it does not return to you without accomplishing it, its purpose. And so we pray that every word that will be proceeding from your mouth this evening is going to indeed accomplish the very purpose that you intend for each one of us. Those that are joining us online, I pray that they will receive the same blessing as those that are in our churches. We pray that your Holy Spirit will protect us and will enable the technology to continue to function as it's supposed to, that your word indeed will be established. We pray that you will bless those amongst us that are not feeling well, uh, mentally, spiritually, and physically. We know that you are God that restores health to those that need it. And so we claim the promises of your healing power upon those that are not well amongst us today. Thank you, Lord, for hearing us, and we commit this meeting into your hand as we begin till we end. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Okay, at this point, um, we are going to go into our lesson on health. And tonight, uh, Sister Mercedes is going to be presenting our lesson for tonight. And I pray that the Lord will bless us with understanding as we go on. God bless you. Talking about uh, temperance. So that is the letter T and celebrations. And if you give me one second, my apologies. I'm going to go ahead and try and share these slides very quickly. And there goes my device, my device, my device, my device. All right, so when we talk about temperance, hold on here. All right, so temperance, when we talk about the definition of temperance is moderation, moderation in action, thought or feeling. So restraint, right? Sense of control. Um, some older definitions or prior definitions you may have heard was moderation or abstinence from use of alcohol beverages. But that doesn't really encompass what temperance is. A definition that may move us closer 
to a wholeness in our living is true temperance teaches us to dispense entirely with everything hurtful and to use judiciously that which is helpful, okay? So this description implies a way of life, all right? So when you think about that, then we can take a look at our own lives and kind of look at, okay, how are we living? Are we excessive in eating, working, playing, sleeping, or whatever it, it may be? So we want to avoid those things that are hurtful to us, but also to judiciously do that, which is helpful. So um, a more one of the most common uh, legal but lethal <laughs> um, drugs is uh, alcohol. Alcohol. So there's many adverse effects of alcohol use, not just for the individual that's using it, but also on their families and their community. So there's a list here of adverse effects, cancer being one of them, and there has been a lot of research done to connect alcohol use with cancer. So not only throat and laryngeal, or esophageal or mouth cancer, stomach cancer, but they're also finding it as well as the colon and breast cancer. This, we're all familiar with liver cirrhosis or liver failure, which can lead to bleeding and ascites. Um, there's also effects of dementia from long-term alcohol use, um, or more acutely, we call it encephalopathy. Um, alcohol also affects the heart muscle, causes heart failure. All right, and it can affect your heart rhythm. Many of you have heard of atrial fibrillation. Um, also known to cause ulcers and gastritis, and the list goes on. Altered mental status and cognition, inability to be rational, altered coordination and perception, loss of inhibition, increased risky behaviors, and increased harm to self and others. And we're all familiar with those tragic effects, okay? Now, there's been some research done, and they looked at most um, toxins or um, drugs, if you will, and they found that the effects of alcohol was worse than the others only because how much it affects not only the individual, but others around them, their families, their friends, relationships, work, the economy, okay? Now, when you talk about heroin and cocaine, of course, those the effects of that worse on the individual. But alcohol, because it's legal, <laughs> um, it has the greatest effect on society. All right. So another another well known um, lethal and freely available uh, drug is going to be tobacco. You can call it a poison. Um, so whether it's smoked or chewed, inhaled, however, whatever forms, it is harmful to the user as well as those around them and has significant effects on health, disease, and death. Okay, so here, tobacco kills nearly 6 million people each year. Approximately one person dies every six seconds as a result of tobacco-related causes and up to half of current users will eventually die of a tobacco-related disease, okay? So we're all familiar with the effects of smoking, tobacco use, uh, not only mouth and mouth cancer, throat cancer, um, heart disease, heart attack, heart failure, um, vascular disease all through your body, stroke, um, and the list goes on. All right, so just like alcohol, tobacco has effects on others. So we call that secondhand smoke, all right? And that, for secondhand smoke, um, that you don't directly have to be smoking, but if, you get, if you're in the enclosed area with the smoke, you too are also affected um, by lung cancer and heart disease and the other effects of smoking. Unfortunately, children are also affected um, by secondhand smoke. So they tend to develop asthma, upper and lower respiratory infections, um, even infants. This is where you, you um, if you're familiar with sudden infant death 
syndrome. And so the list goes on. Also keep in mind, folks don't think about this, but uh, tobacco smoke has many toxins and chemicals, not only just nicotine. So there is about 4,000 chemicals in tobacco smoke. At least 250 of these are known to be harmful and 50 are known to be cancer causing. So keep that in mind. All right, so not only do we want to avoid harmful substances, but again, we talk about using judiciously what is helpful to us, what is good for us. So as we take stock of our own lives, there may be areas in which we lack balance, such as sleeping too little, working too hard, not exercising enough, or maybe we're exercising too much, I don't know, is that possible? Eating too much, and even the use and possible abuse of social media, and the list goes on. So it's really looking at balance in all areas of our lives. So even the most strong-willed among us is unable to achieve true balance in all things without a strong reliance on the power of a gracious and almighty God. So even the most disciplined might have a little bit of a challenge being balanced in all areas. But by the grace of God, uh, we are able to sustain, we're able to be sustained and strengthened so we have we have the ability to make wise choices, okay? So lastly, remember Paul's counsel to us. So there's a verse in 1 Corinthians 10, 31 that says, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. Realizing that this is a very tall order, we are again given the secret of power and success. And that is found in Philippians 4.13 that says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, through him that gives me strength. It is encouraging to remember that help is never far away. God is not far from each of us, for in him we live and move and have our being. Our gracious Heavenly Father stands ready to guide our choices, ensuring a sustained and successful true balance in life. And this calls for celebration. All right. So may God uh, bless us as we try our best to live temperate lives. Thank you. Thank you, Sister Mercedes, for that uh, teaching on temperance. We are all called to living lives of, uh, of mastering how to be temperate in all things. And as the verse that M Sister Mercedes just read, we can do all things through Christ Jesus. God can enable us all to lead such a life. All right. So let's continue tonight with our quiz and uh, if you are having the envelopes that has the portions of the marks where you will mark true or false it's the five questions that we have again as always uh, let's uh, put on our bible student hats and let's see how we master our studies of the word so question number one for today, I'm going to read the f uh, five questions and then we'll go through to see what you will have uh, put in as your answer. Question number one, according to John chapter 5, verse 28 and 29, the time is coming when all who are in their graves will be resurrected. According to John chapter 5, verse 28 and 29, the time is coming when all who are in the graves will be resurrected. Question number two. First Timothy chapter 6 verse 13 to 16 confirms that only God has immortality or that the ability in him to live forever. 
1 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 13 to 16 confirms that only God has immortality or the ability in him to live forever. True or false? Right, number three. According to the Bible, death is best described as sleep. According to the Bible, death is best described as sleep. True or false? Okay, question number, uh, number four. According to the Bible, dust plus breath equals a living soul. So living beings are living souls. According to the Bible, dust plus breath equals a living soul. So living beings are living souls. And the last question, the experience of Jesus, the experience Jesus endured in the Garden of Gethsemane as well as on the cross was eternal death. The experience Jesus endured in the Garden of Gethsemane as well as on the cross was eternal death. Okay, so let's uh, go through the five questions with the answers now to see what you have. According to John chapter 5, verse 28 and 29, the time is coming when all who are in their graves will be resurrected. That's true or false? True. Everyone is going to be resurrected. The righteous and those that have died in sin and then... The results for those that will have received Christ, they will live eternally. And then those that have lived lives of sinfulness, then they will receive their reward as well. All right. First Timothy chapter 6, verse 13 and up to 16 confirms that only God has immortality or the ability in him to live forever. That's true. None has the ability to live in and of themselves except God because he is the originator of life. He's the one that gives life to us all and only he has that ability to live forever. According to, to the Bible, death is best described as sleep. And that's true. A lot of uh, the... New Testament examples and even Jesus himself referred to death as sleep. According to the Bible, number four, according to the Bible, dust plus breath equals a living soul. So living beings are living souls. True or false? That's correct. We heard that even from last night's uh, presentation by the pastor, how he exposed and explored on that uh, subject. And last question, the experience Jesus endured in the Garden of Gethsemane as well as on the cross was eternal death. <laughs> okay, is that true or false? True. Jesus experienced uh, suffering in the Garden of Gethsemane and his death on the cross was an experience of eternal death. He lost so much that we don't even understand. And only once he comes and takes us to heaven and we will learn more about how much he lost so that we can have eternal life itself. So may God bless us as we study these subjects. I hope that it will encourage us to uh, study these subjects even more so that we can have a full understanding to become workmen of God's word. All right. So we're going to continue now as we uh, go to the next phase as we will hear a song from Carla Mello. Yeah. 
It's nobody's fault but mine. Nobody's fault but mine. Cause if I die and my soul be lost, it's nobody's fault but mine. It's nobody's fault but mine. Nobody's fault but mine. Cause if I die, and my soul be lost it's nobody's fault but mine i've got a bible i can read if i choose i've got a bible i can read if i choose cause if i die and my soul be lost it's nobody's fault but mine I've got two knees, I can pray if I choose. I've got two knees, I can pray if I choose. Cause if I die and my soul be lost, it's nobody's fault but mine. I've got a mouth I can teach if I choose. I've got a mouth I can teach if I choose. Cause if I die and my soul be lost, it's nobody's fault but mine. Nobody's fault but mine. Nobody's fault but mine. Cause if I die and this soul be lost, it's nobody's fault but Good evening once again to those of you here at Calvary and also at Bethany on YouTube and also on Facebook and Zoom. You know, I, I could just kind of wish that the Lord would just zoom right on in and just take us on the glory now, but um, we'll have to wait for that, patiently wait, but he will come soon. That is a special theme in the scriptures and uh, even John the Apostle who wrote Revelation, he said, even so, come, Lord Jesus. Amen. Well, tonight we're going to be dealing with the comings. With the comings. We'll touch on one, but we'll spend most of our time on two of the comings. And so let's bow our heads as we begin with a word of prayer. 
Heavenly Father, we look to you as a God that is rich in mercy. You do not want anyone to be lost. You want them to be saved. And we know, Lord, that time is winding up, so people need to be making their decisions for eternal salvation now. And we, Lord, here and on Facebook and YouTube and Zoom and Bethany, we are making decisions and we have made decisions and we are choosing you. We want you in us and we love the idea of us in you. In the wonderful name of Christ, speak to us now and get us ready. In Jesus' name, amen. We'd like for you to consider again the popular scripture, just a portion of it, but it's in John chapter 14 where Jesus made a promise to his disciples. He promised by saying, I will come again and receive you unto myself. And then he, was, he made it clear that he would also take us to where he is now. In fact, before ascending to heaven, Jesus and the angels promised his followers he would return. We saw that in John, also in the book of Acts, Acts chapter uh, 1, verses 9 to 11, we have uh, two angels who appear like men that make it clear that this same Jesus will so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. Amen. Paul, led by the Holy Spirit, again, led by the Spirit, called this return a second time. Notice what he says in Hebrews chapter 9, verses 28, and chapter 5, verse 9. You can look that up as extra. We're quoting verse 28 in chapter 9 of Hebrews. He says, So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. And unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. That word salvation can be translated as deliverance and health. Amen. This, my brothers and sisters, is the third phase of salvation deliverance and uh, salvation, which we had studied. We learned that there were three phases. One in, that was in the past tense, what Christ did uh, in, in uh, coming here and dying for the sins of the world. And then there's the present sin phase where we are being saved, which is uh, used in the present tense. And then there's the future phase where Jesus comes to deliver us from this sin-cursed world. Hallelujah. Uh, that wants to make us economic slaves, have mercy, uh, he will come and take us from this world to another. Amen. Then we'll be brought back here. And he said he's going to make all things what? New. So uh, this is not dealing with sin, but with salvation. Similar to what God did for the children of Israel when he brought them out of Egypt, out of captivity, and he took them where? To the promised land. Amen. Oh, we want to go. We want to go. So, some say that Jesus will come secretly. Have you heard that before? They call it the secret rapture, and I'm sure they're very sincere. That's something that it wasn't necessarily preached by any of the apostles or taught by Jesus Christ. It just appeared about 200 years ago. Oh, just over. Yeah, about 200 years ago. It's a new thing. Have mercy. But anyway, that's what they believe. And uh, they believe that Christ will come secretly and he will suddenly just snatch away people right out of their clothing, right out of their planes, right out of their car. You've seen it depicted in pictures and uh, illustrations, this idea. But I have not really read anything quite like that that's in the Bible where people, where people will be snatched out of their bodies I mean, snatched out of their clothes and their bodies taken away or whatever. I, I haven't seen or heard, heard that in the scriptures. So, in fact, it seems to be 
quite contrary to what Jesus promised us in John chapter 14, verse 3. And what Paul says in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 28. And then we read last night, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 and 18. It sounds like Jesus coming back and taking his people who were dead out of the grave and those who were alive, taking them with them together and meeting him in the, with the clouds. Just like he left, he ascended up into the clouds, but this time he's going back to the same place to be with them. No secret about it. The second time is what Paul said. That's his second coming. They go together. First coming, a baby. Second coming, hey, he's the Lord our salvation. Amen. Christ will not come in some secret rapture way. In fact, if we go to Matthew, Matthew chapter 24, Matthew chapter 24, and in Matthew chapter 24, let's look at a few things here real quickly. Jesus says in verse 23, then if any man shall say unto you, lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not, for there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great, what? Signs and wonders insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Wow. Now, notice what also he says in verse 27. Notice what he says. In fact, let's include verse 26. It says, wherefore, if they shall say unto you, behold, he is in the desert, Go not forth. Behold, he is in the what? Secret chambers. In other words, there's nothing secret about Jesus' coming. Okay, but he's telling us there's going to be false Christ, false prophets. Uh, some people have been called prophets who were predicting this secret rapture teaching. He says, behold, he is in the secret chambers. Believe it not. And then verse 27, for as lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Jesus is very specific on this point. It is important for God's people not to be deceived by the devil's last day deceptions into believing something other than his second coming. So we're going to look at a few things tonight that may shock you, but... I'd rather be shocked and saved than uh, shocked and angry and be lost. Come on, y'all. So, the second time, our second coming. He's not coming in a secret way. Our, you know what? Out of the heart, the mouth what? It speaks. Let's see what Jesus says out of his heart, through his mouth. You remember... In Matthew chapter 26, verses 62 to 67, Jesus is standing before those bad boys of the New Testament who are out for blood concerning him. He stands before the Sanhedrin council and under oath to Caiaphas and all those that were listening. I quote now that Jesus said, Here after, here when? Here after, in other words, after this or next, shall ye see. That's those men who were lost that were uh, determined to crucify him, to get him killed. They wanted to get him out of the way. He tells Caiaphas and them that ye shall see, shall ye see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. In other words, he will come seen with the clouds, clouds of angels. Uh, Matthew chapter 24, verses 23 to 27, we read some of that. But also, while you're still there, go to verses 30 to 31. Verse 30, it says, And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power 
and great glory. Verse 31, and he shall send his angels, so there, the, there they are, uh, with a great, what, sound of a trumpet. Isn't that what Paul said in 2 Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4? With the sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. This is the gathering up. They're taking them, and they're going someplace. This place is not our home. Amen. All right, this is not the home that the Lord intended for us. So, Caiaphas and all those that were with him will be raised to see Jesus coming. He said it under what? Oath. Now, these are wicked people. Those were sinners. They crucified Christ. So if they're going to get to see him, guess what? Not only will the righteous see him when he comes that are alive, but those who are wicked. God's no respecter of persons. He will give you what you have chosen. And that's what he does with them. John saw uh, this when he said in Revelation chapter 1, verse 7, he said in Revelation chapter 1, verse 7, Behold, be what? Look, pay attention. He cometh with clouds. This is the clouds of angels, folk, coming. Each one has an assignment to go get somebody amongst us. Amen. Can't wait to meet my, my angel or angels that the Lord has assigned to me. But anyway, they will go to the earth, throughout the earth, and every eye shall see him how many eyes every eye shall see him they also which what pierced him that happened 2,000 years ago which means there's a special resurrection for them it's a miniature one but a special resurrection for them because Jesus said it under oath and all kindreds of the earth shall well because of him even so amen John says amen Lord that's all right they, they had their chance uh, if their soul was lost, it's nobody's fault but theirs. Thank you so much, sis. That went with the sermon. Nobody's fault but mine. All right? God is trying to save. Jesus, didn't he say in John chapter 3, uh, verse 17, that the Son of Man was not sent to, con to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. This is the saving time. And folk are running and fighting, fighting those who want to give them Jesus. So his crucifiers will be raised. Pilate will be in the group too, I'm sure. So for believers, Christ's death for our sins saves us from its penalty of eternal death. His second coming saves us from the presence of sin. In other words, he... He himself even comes without sin unto salvation to get his people away from a world of sin. Amen. He, 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 he is also our savior from satanic deceptions in these last days. Today, the world stage is actually set for the global acceptance of various false Christ, cosmic Christs, if you so please. But we remember what Jesus already told us in John chapter 14, verses 1 through 4. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. I'm going to put Michael maybe there also. You can put your name in there too. Amen? Amen. Jesus is in heaven now, so uh, it just makes sense. All right, so folks, we just had a little bit of an interruption. Anybody remember where I left off? 
Huh? Tonka. All right. Okay, they were dealing with, we were dealing with the deceptions and so on. Okay. All right. So the interesting thing, when you consider what is taking place in this world today, I really don't, I don't want to really be here anymore anyway. But Jesus, he's in heaven. That's where we want to be. Many people think that for some reason Jesus is going to come back, but he's going to secretly take some folk away. And then after a time of trouble, he's going to come back now with all of his glory and everybody will see him. And then he's going to set up his kingdom here on earth as it is. Now, folk, there's a number of things wrong with that picture because it doesn't reflect what the scriptures have told us. Thank you. Right, the preacher got a little break. All right, so, but instead, the reality is what we've already read. We've seen this. Jesus is in heaven. That's where he's at. That's where he has to take us because that's what he promised. Where he is, that's where he will take us. So, he was not talking about somewhere on earth, but heaven. There he has prepared a place for us, a heavenly city, the new Jerusalem. Its builder and maker is God. That's Jesus. He's equal with God. Amen. It, it is uh, in, mentioned in Revelation chapter 21, verse 2, about the new Jerusalem coming down. We're going to take a look at that by God's grace. So Christ promises that the next time he returns, it will be to take all believers to where he has made us that place and we'll live with him in his father's house. Amen. So how many comings will Jesus actually have had after all is said and done? Well, if you were to go to Luke chapter 2, verses 1, 7, and 11, you would find uh, that we're told, For unto you is born this day, in the city of David, a Savior who is Christ the Lord. That was his first coming. He came as a babe, grew up to be in his 30s, suffered for our sins, died for our sins upon the cross. But notice what we already read in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 28. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the what? How many times? Second time without sin. In other words, he's not going to be doing any priestly intercession. The priestly intercession is over. Whatever he's doing up in heaven concerning uh, making sure he separated the sheep from the goat, that's already over. Second time. Then in Zechariah, we haven't visited Zechariah. We're going to knock on his book's door at Zechariah chapter 14, verses 4 through 11, especially verse 4, which says, and his, somebody there? Is somebody there? What, what happens? What happens in verse 4? Zechariah chapter 14, verse 4. And his what? His what? His feet shall stand in that day. Which day? Uh, you, do you have to think about that? It's not the first coming. We all know that. And it's not the second coming because we know what happens with that. But the third coming and his feet shall what? Stand in that day up on the Mount of Olives. Remember in the second coming we see Jesus. He stays where? In the, in the air. All right. 
So he stays in the air. That's what happens. And they meet him in the air, and so shall they ever be with the Lord. In this case, he comes down to the earth. This is his third coming. In that day, upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem, on the east and uh, and the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west, and there shall be a very great valley, and half of the mountain shall remove toward the north and half of it toward the south. You see, during Christ's first coming, he lived and died to save humanity from extinction. At his second coming, he takes the redeemers from earth to heaven as he promised us before he uh, left. So he must cause when he comes, though the, at his second coming, he causes the first what? The first what? Resurrection of the dead. That's because he has, on well, the second coming, he's coming to get his people to take them back. Now, what that means is that when he comes this third time, where is he coming from? He's coming from heaven, right? This, and he's coming this time with the holy city, the heavenly city, and he's coming back this time with all the redeemed because the, 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 um, the meek shall inherit the what? The earth. This will be their home. So he's coming back, and so he splits out the Mount of Olive so that there's a place for the new city, the new Jerusalem. Amen. For it to sit down in, coming back to rest there forever and ever. So what we have to understand is that this marks the beginning of the thousand years. Well, where'd you get that, Pastor Moore? Well, uh, John, who got his revelation from Jesus Christ, uh, he tells us so. Go to Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20. And we see what the revelator, John, we say John the revelator, but really it was Jesus who is the revelator. Uh, it opens up with saying that it's the revelation of Jesus Christ. Revelation chapter 20, verses 4 through 6. Verse 4 says, And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment, this is the righteous, those who have been uh, saved, judgment was given unto them, and I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, but they're alive now, and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the what? Beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their forehead or in their hands. And they, what, lived, because they had been beheaded, but now they live, which means they experienced a what? A resurrection, right? They lived and reigned with Christ how long? All right. Then look at what it says next. And for the word of God, da, 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 da. okay, there we go. All right, verse 5. But the rest of the dead lived not again until when? The thousand years were finished. This is the what? First resurrection we're dealing with, especially now. This is the first resurrection. The first res resurrection happens at the beginning of the thousand years. The second resurrection, which is the one unto damnation, that happens at the end of the thousand years. And all those who are wicked will come up in that one. And so everyone will be at that has lived even before the flood, all the way back from Adam, all the way up to here, will be alive at the same time on the home, on the home that God, we call earth. Amen. God called earth. All right. That, to me, that is amazing. Folk will see dead loved ones. Hopefully, their dead loved ones are on the inside of the city and not on the outside. Hopefully, you and I will be on the inside of the city and not on the outside. And to make sure that we're on the inside, we need to have Jesus on the inside. Amen. Amen. So let's let him stay in and the world and its worldliness stay out. Thank you, Lord. All right, so, 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 so here we have three comings of Christ. 
We're not going to spend much time on that third coming. We'll spend a good amount of time on it. That's because it brings so many other teachings together and you get to see the broad picture of what takes place. So the lost dead, though when Jesus' second coming takes place, there's no resurrection for them. When does their resurrection take place? At the end of the thousand years. All right? But those who are wicked, the lost, they're actually destroyed. Oh, well, Jesus tried to get them ready. He wanted to give them his protective robe of righteousness. He wanted to give them uh, a, a new heart and a new mind. But they made their choice. They, they wanted to do what they wanted to do. And eventually they made their ultimate and final choice. So they did not get to be equipped with what was necessary to be translated and changed so that they could go to heaven. They could have received an immortal body which could have handled the brightness of his coming. The Bible tells us that God's presence is like a consuming what? Fire. Fire. But the angels, they're not getting burnt up. Last I saw or read about Moses and Elijah who had uh, both gone to heaven and Jesus uh, saw them on the Mount of Transfiguration. They didn't look like they had, they had, be, they had been in the presence of God. They weren't damaged. The righteous can dwell in everlasting burnings. It's the lost. And we'll have to spend some time talking about what that is, what kind of torment that is. Uh, people have gotten it bent out of shape and all wrong. You see, the wicked, they don't like to be reminded of how wicked they are. You and I don't like to be reminded of how we messed up. Somebody tell us, how do you feel? Come on, y'all. You can feel a bit upset. You don't like to see that about yourself. But now they're in the presence of God who is truth. He, 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 he exudes truth. He's a perfect love. And they're, they're being exposed to this. That, you know, it was already tough and hard enough for the Jews who rejected Jesus to handle being in his presence. They, they hated him. He, he, he would say things that rebuked them. It was tough. Can you imagine how tough it will be when the, all the glory is there? Woo! But anyway, that's not what we're dealing with tonight. So, at his second coming, we probably need to deal with this. Go to Revelation chapter 6. Revelation chapter 6, it tells us, this, this, this kind of lets us know where, where we are too. We're going to Revelation chapter 6 and verse, mm, yeah, yeah, let's go ahead and look at verse 12. And I heard when he had opened the sea, sixth seal, there's seven, the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair. And the moon became his blood. That happened already, folk. But it can happen again. Verse 13. And the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heavens departed as a what? Now this part has not happened. Do you know that if the heavens parted as a scroll, in other words, they break open, What's going to happen to Earth's atmosphere? Huh? So much for this effort for climate change. Uh, that's going to be a dramatic climate change, isn't it? All right, so, but that's what it's telling us. This is happening. And notice the context here. Notice the context. We're going to keep, keep going here. Uh, it says, uh, all right, there it is. Um, verse 12. Nope, I'm in the wrong place there. Um, six, he said, he, verse 14, that's where it is. Okay, thank, thank you. And the heavens departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. Folks, that has not happened yet. Okay? 
Not yet, but we're, it's, it's very close to happening. Uh, do you know that this planet is experiencing more earthquakes than it ever has before? Thousands of them. All right. Uh, verse 15. And the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains. Verse 16. And said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? They could have been ready. They could have been equipped. But what we have to hope and pray, because some folk uh, may experience, have an experience like the thief on the cross, amen? And those last, uh, that last day of life, they make the right decision. But why take that risk and wait until it could be too late? Do it now! So the righteous will be taken to heaven. The wicked, they want death. They have chosen. Hide us. Now, if, a rock, if rocks and mountains fall on you, what's going to happen to you? You're going to what? Are you, you're going to die. That's what they're crying out. They choose death. God lets them have what they've chosen. Okay? So this earth will be devastated. It will be in a chaotic state, similar to like it was uh, in the beginning. But it's going to be empty. In fact, John saw the earth's atmosphere. Yes, he saw it rolled away. But also Jeremiah saw no human being will be alive on the earth because of the coming of the presence of the Lord. Go to Jeremiah chapter 23. Jeremiah chapter 23. And we'll try to take a quick peek here at what at some of the things that he may say, have said there. Jeremiah chapter 23, I'm sorry, chapter 4, chapter 4, Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 23. And you can read to your heart's content verses 23 to 29, and you'll see what we are talking about here. Some of you have already started reading there, and I hope you'll You'll finish Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 23. How does it begin? <laughs> Boy, these pages are really tough to get them open. But anyway, I'm going to try to read at least one or two of these verses here. Verse 23, which says, I beheld the earth, and it was what? Without form, and void, and the heavens... And they had no what? Okay, remember the, the moon? We, the, we sing songs about the moon, the moon and also the sun. Sun going dark and so on. Verse 24, I beheld the mountains and lo, they what? Trembled. And all the hills, what moved what? Lightly. Similar to what John said. Uh, 25, and I beheld and lo, there was no man. And all the birds of the heavens fled. They were gone. No birds. All right, so notice what he says here. For thus, yeah, verse 26, I beheld and lo, the fruitful place was a wilderness, and all the cities thereof were what? Broken down at the presence of the Lord and by his fierce anger. Wow. So it's going to be devastated. It's not going to be a home. It's going to be a hazard. <laughs> All right. Uh, so, so, and so we saw that. We looked at Revelation chapter 6, verses 11, verse 11, and so on, verse, to, verse 11 to 17. Isaiah has similar words to say. You can write this down. Isaiah chapter 24, verses 20, 20, chapter 24, verses 22, 23. Or in other words... Verse 20, all the way over to 23. All right, so the righteous are home in heaven while the earth is devastated and the devil and his angels are actually left here on earth with nobody to tempt or mess with at all because what happened to all of the wicked dead? They're still in the grave, right? What happened to the living and even those that had the special resurrection? They... They're destroyed, they're, dest they're slain too, there's nobody left. And where are the righteous? 
in heaven. Hey, I'm looking forward to being there, and I want to see my friends and also my enemies there. Amen. Uh, I want to see that happen, and so we got to do what we can to get the word out. So during that time, Satan and his angels, they're here on earth with nobody to tempt, and the earth is disastrous, and he sees the result of his sinful ways. Disaster. Folk, hopefully you'll see it before the, the, before the devil does, and you'll make your decision now to make your calling and election sure. According to Jesus, the righteous shall inherit the earth, Matthew 5, 5. Thus he and they, yes, they'll come to heaven that third time as God promised that he would make all things new. And Zechariah chapter 14, verse 4 will take place. Now, I do want to share some things with you. I'm, I'm so happy to be able to share these things with you because it helps you to know what Jesus said is the truth about the false Christ and the false prophets especially. All right? So, go to 2 Thessalonians. Second what? Thessalonians chapter 2. This is the only place in the Bible where we have this, these things recorded together. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 8. All right, verse 8, it says, and uh, give you a little more. Yeah, verse 8, it says, And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall what? With what? Shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. And then it says in verse 9, our key verse for this moment, Even him whose coming is after the working of who? Satan. Guess who's coming to dinner? Satan with how much? All power and signs and lying wonders. Here we have, and then shall the wicked be revealed whom the Lord basically shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. That word coming is a Greek word, parousia. There's one for Jesus' coming and there's a parousia for the devil's coming. Oh, some of y'all didn't know that. Yes, deceivers will cause some Christians to believe that the devil, when he comes to counterfeit Christ's coming, that he is the true Christ. All their followers, doesn't matter what religion or what faith, Buddhism, Hinduism, uh, what is it, uh, uh, the Islamic faith, Muslims, uh, all those different religions, they will be gathered together by the enemy of souls if they have not received Christ. Lord have mercy. Now, some of you may not realize that the Thessalonian Christians who Paul was writing to in 2 Thessalonians, they actually believed a lie. That's what got them into trouble. They were crying, they were boo-hooing, they were so sad. Why? Because... They had been deceived into believing that Christ had already come and resurrected the dead saints and left them behind. Sound familiar? Like the secret rapture teaching? Do you think if the devil was deceptive back then and he used it and it was effective on the Thessalonians, do you think that he would use it again in these last days? Okay. So that's what they believed. They thought they were in the last days, and that was a false teaching about Christ's coming. Paul wrote to save them from such fanaticism and erroneous understanding about the coming of Christ to help them and a future generation of Christians not to be deceived by the false teachings of others. Jesus said, don't let any man deceive you. All right, Paul uses that Greek word, Perusia, Satan will be the last false Christ to come. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So followers of the true Christ 
who teach the true second coming of Jesus will expose, even now we're exposing Satan's deceptions. And Jesus warns us with a heart of love. He doesn't want to lose any of us. He warns us not to go and see any of these false Christs. Don't go to see it. You'll be charmed. You'll be fascinated. Time will go by. And this rascal, the devil, knows how to hypnotize folk, too. So be careful. Also, not long, not too long ago, CNN actually witnessed Lord Maitreya, who appeared descending from the sky. And he went around healing folk, working a few miracles. And then afterwards, he stepped away and he ascended up into the heavens and disappeared. Mm. Lord Maitreya. Benjamin, the late Benjamin Cream, he never did get to see his quote unquote Messiah or, the, you know, uh, actually go ahead and reveal himself to the whole world. He died and went into a grave believing in a false Christ. Recently, a highly favored, revered Jewish rabbi named Yaakov Zish Schultz said publicly that Rabbi Chaim Kanitsky has been in communication with the Messiah, that's the Christ, claiming that he will appear to the world soon. Wow. All right. That's pretty recent, 2020. One thing about these false Christs, they know some things about Christ's coming, and they're counting on deceiving people who don't study their Bible and definitely don't know Jesus Christ. Because any false Christ coming, you will know because Jesus has made it clear he's not touching this earth until his third coming. Amen. He stays in the clouds. Now, also, some of you may not be aware that Alice A. Bailey who lived from 1880 to 1949, she was a high priest and prophetess of the New Age movement. She claimed before she died to have messages from a spirit, Tibetan, Dawal Kul. She wrote a book about preparing the world for the reappearance of Christ. She said, I dedicate myself anew to the service of the coming one and will do all I can to prepare men's minds and hearts for that event. I have no other life intention. Bailey, AA, and also Discipleship in the New Age, Volume 11, New York, Lucius, which stands for Lucifer. Trust, page 226. Jesus was right. He's right about everything because he reveals the truth. The Bible tells us, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel. That's a messenger of light. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 13 to 15. He is able to do this. And so suddenly, one day, a beautiful, bright, and dazzling, glorious being will appear, perhaps with 12 apostles and thousands of glorious-looking angels. Enthusiastically, people will proclaim, Christ is here! Christ is here! And they'll be looking at you to see just how happy you are. Because the Christ is coming to your city, coming to Gordonsville. He's coming to Charlottesville. Walking around here, uh uh-uh. And if you do not believe in this Christ who has been casting out COVID and casting out demons and healing people of AIDS and cancer and all kinds of disease, folk are going to think, can't you see? Are you crazy? Can't you tell this is Jesus? This, nobody else could heal and work miracles like this, but Jesus... But you and I will know because we've studied the word and we know Jesus. And that's not Jesus. Watch his methods. Bailey says he'll be coming with this special influence. 
He'll be channeling to everybody to want to have positive human relationships. And she said, everybody that believes in that, that we all just come together and just love each other and have all these positive relationships, that's how he's going to garner, garner them in. And then those who tend to be separate, which is what God told us Christians to, to do, be ye separate and touch not the unclean. Well, they say, well, they'll be exposed for who they really are. But I don't care. I, I belong to Jesus. He purchased me with my blood. What about you? And so, Lord, as we bow our heads, we believe on you. We've chosen you. We realize that the devil, he is deceptive. He deceived us on some things before we studied your word and before we opened our hearts fully to you so that you could come in and teach us and grow us and minister to us. Oh, Lord, our lives are so much better because of you. And, Lord, you went through so much more. Strengthen us, Lord. Help us to be, yes, ready for your coming, but also to know you. Isn't that what you said, Jesus? You wanted us to know you and your Father who sent you. Have your way with us. Forgive us our sins, Lord. Make our eyes which have been blinded by the world and the worldliness. Open them up so we turn our back on the ways of the world and we go the way of the creator and maker and savior of the world, full throttle. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, been a good group, folks. Thank you so much for being with us. Those of you who have made your decision to believe this, which you have heard, the truths that you've heard tonight, if everything made sense, check box number one uh, in your quiz envelope. Check box number one in the upper right-hand corner. Box number one, if it was all clear to you. And then in box number two, box number two, you've made your decision to live in harmony with God's will so you will be ready when Jesus comes, put a check in box number two. All right. Thank you so much. God bless you all. Have a wonderful night.